Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Sosedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over an introduction to light and waves and we're going to be going over a couple of important calculations. So make sure you have your calculator out and that you're following along with our note packet. So the first thing we have to do is talk about actually what is light altogether. It's a form of electromagnetic radiation that is visible to the human eye. And that's when we're talking about visible light, the type of light that we normally think about. Uh, what is electromagnetic radiation then? And so we're going to be abbreviating electromagnetic radiation as EMR. It's basically just a form of energy that acts like a wave. And now on your actual note packet, you should have uh, so sort of like a weird little table thing like this. And the reason why is you're going to be filling in uh, the different types of electromagnetic radiation. So over here on the far left, so right over here, uh, we have radio waves, and so make sure you realize that all the way at the very end of our spectrum we have radio waves. Right here we have microwaves. I'm just going to put a little micro symbol. Right here we have IR, or infrared. That little tiny sliver that you see here that looks like a little rainbow, that is visible light. That's actually what our human eye can comprehend. Next to it we have UV, then we have X-ray, and then at the very end here we have our high energy photons, which we call gamma rays. Now, why do I want you to know these in, en in order? It's because of the amount of energy they have, and so we need to know the relationship between frequency and wavelength. And so over here, you can also write this down, we have very long wavelengths, over here we have very short wavelengths. And so I'm just going to abbreviate wavelength as WV for now. There actually is an abbreviation that we'll talk about in a little bit though. And then frequency wise, we have very high frequency waves and very short frequency waves. So over here we have high frequency, and so I'm just going to put an F, and we have very low frequency waves all the way over here. And so we'll be talking about those, so make sure that you write those down and fill those in. If you've had a math class or a physics class that talks about waves, then these should be familiar terms. So you can pause this and see if you can match the following terms with a definition. So we have amplitude, trough, crest, and then we have wavelength. So what exactly are the answers to this? Well, the peak of the wave is called a crest. The base of a wave is called a trough. The distance between two consecutive crests, that's called a wavelength and I'll show you the symbol for wavelength next. And the distance from origin to crest is the amplitude. If I can spell amplitude right. All right, now, the symbol for wavelength, probably something that we're gonna be seeing a lot of this entire unit, it looks like this. So I'm gonna draw it very large over here in the corner. Uh, that is our symbol for wavelength. And so actually, you know what? I should have put it right here since this says wavelength. Uh, that's our symbol. It's a Greek letter. It's called lambda, and uh, it's something that we're going to be seeing a lot of. Other than that, we have one last definition here. It says it's the number of waves that pass a point in a given second, and that's called frequency. And so there's a symbol for frequency. Uh, frequency doesn't have exactly you know, the fanciest of symbols, and often it's just abbreviated as the letter V. Um, it actually is a Greek letter, but um, that's how we're going to kind of be abbreviating frequency. We're going to be using the letter V since it would be, you know, kind of easy to type it out if we ever had to. So again, wavelength right here and then frequency, which is the letter V. So now that we have looked at what wavelength and frequency are, we have to talk about the relationship between both wavelength and remember, it looks like this and frequency. Uh, it's an inverse relationship. So that means that if wavelength is up, then frequency is down. That also means that if wavelength is down, then frequency is up. That's the relationship between an inverse function. So what does this mean? Wavelength, if it is long, then frequency is low. If the wavelength is short, then the frequency is high. So they're opposites. So this picture perfectly summarizes that if you have a very long wavelength like this, then that means you have a very low frequency. So that means that there aren't as many waves passing a point in a given second. If you have a very short wavelength, like right here, then you have a higher frequency. More waves are going to be passing a point in a given second. 
That's what an inverse relationship is all about. So how do we express this inverse relationship mathematically? Well, it's pretty simple. It is the equation c equals lambda times v. That's called the speed of light equation. Why is it called the speed of light equation? Well, we know what these two values represent. We know that we have wavelength and we have frequency. What the heck is c? Well, c is the speed of light. And that's why it's called the speed of light equation. And so speed of light is measured in meters per second. Wavelength is what our next symbol represents, so that's lambda. That has to be measured in meters. Now frequently it's measured in nanometers, so we'll talk about how to convert between those. And then next we have frequency. My writing's getting worse. Frequency. Uh, that's measured in a very strange unit. It's called inverse seconds. I know that sounds strange, but the more common abbreviation for inverse seconds is the symbol HZ for Hertz. And so if you've ever looked at anything regarding a computer or phone, when they talk about megahertz or gigahertz, that's what they're referring to. It's the frequency. Because my writing was so bad, I decided to actually type out what these were. <laughs> um, the relationship, though, that you may or may not remember since it was all the way back in Unit 1, is what nano means. Uh, remember, nano represents 10 to the power of 9 nanometers are in one meter. And that's the important relationship to remember. So whenever you see nm, that's nanometer, and 10 to the power of 9 nanometers are in one meter. We'll be using that in like two seconds. How are we going to use these conversion factors? You probably forgot, but here's your refresher course all the way back from Unit 1. So we use the factor label method. I'm always starting with what I'm given over here in the corner. So that's 180 nanometers. And then I have my unit in my factor label method, my conversion factor, that goes with the given on the bottom and what I want my unit to be on the top. Then all I have to remember is my relationship between nanometers and meters. And there are 10 to the power of 9 nanometers in 1 meter. So all I have to do now is do this in my calculator. 180 nanometers times 1 meter divided by 10 to the power of 9. And so if you're getting some sort of strange answer that doesn't look like what I'm getting here, uh, just remember that you probably need to put the entire thing in parentheses like that. So you probably need to put 10 to the power of 9 in parentheses in order to get that to work, since we are using exponents. Now what do you end up getting? You end up getting an answer, in scientific notation at least, that is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. And that would be your answer, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. If you've got something else, then try what I said. Try to put your 10 to the 9th power in parentheses. All right, now let's do the opposite. So I still use my factor label method. So I have 5.4 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. And I want to convert that to nanometers. So in my factor label method, I put the unit I'm given on the bottom and the unit that I want on top. Again, I need to know my relationship, and that's 10 to the 9th over 1 meter in this situation. Just like before, if you're going to get a weird answer, it's probably because you didn't put these weird exponent things in parentheses like that in your calculator. So when you plug that into your calculator, what do you get? You get 540 nanometers, and that makes sense given our answer to the last one. And so that's how you can convert from nanometers to meters or meters to nanometers. So the previous equation gave us the relationship between uh, wavelength and frequency. Now there's also a relationship between the amount of energy that something has and its frequency. And so what is the relationship between energy and frequency? So that is a direct relationship which is the opposite of an inverse relationship. So that means that if the frequency is low, then the energy is small. And if the frequency is high, the energy is large. So in other words, if energy is very large, then your frequency is also going to be very large. If the energy is low, then your frequency is going to be low. Notice that and compare it to what we talked about with the speed of light equation. They're two different things. And so I have the same picture here on the bottom, but what I should be able to point out is that this very low frequency wave has a very low energy. It is a weaker uh, wave. The higher frequency wave, which looks like this, has a very high energy. And so you might want to write that down near that picture because that's a really good sort of um, brief and concise way of looking at this. Um, 
again, actually, you know what? I'm also going to put down this. Uh, this is a weaker wave. It just is. It's weaker. This is a stronger wave. And it is just that. It's stronger. What makes it stronger? The amount of energy they have. And so high energy, um, high frequency waves are much stronger and more powerful than lower frequency, low energy waves. They're a lot weaker. So mathematically, how do we represent the relationship between energy and frequency? Well, we have a different equation, and that's sometimes called the energy of light equation. So we have E equals H times V. You can probably guess what E stands for. That stands for energy. Okay, and energy has many different units, but we're going to be using joules, which is a capital letter J. H is a constant, and it's called Planck's constant, named after a very famous uh, physicist. Okay, it has very strange units, just kind of like the speed of light does. Uh, its unit is joule times seconds, called joule seconds. And then last but not least here, we know that our letter V is frequency. And yes, frequency is still measured in inverse seconds or in hertz. So what are the key relationships that we might need to be able to convert between here? Again, because of my horrible writing, I decided to sort of include this as just a little bit of background information. Well, the two key prefixes that show up whenever we're dealing with energy and when we're dealing with frequency are mega and kilo. And so, again, in case you don't remember from Unit 1, here are our relationships between mega and kilo. So a mega is 10 to the 6th power, and a kilo is 10 to the 3rd power. So there are 10 to the 6th power hertz in 1 megahertz. In kilos, there are 10 to the 3rd joules in 1 kilojoule. Again, very important relationships. So how are we going to utilize this? Well, let's convert 700 joules to kilojoules, and let's convert 500 megahertz to hertz. So again, I have to set up my factor label method, and I start in the corner with what I know, which is 700 joules. That's my given information. I have my given value in joules, and I want to convert that to kilojoules. So all I need to do now is figure out what my relationship is, and that is 10 to the third power and kilojoules would be just 1. So again, in my calculator, I would do 700 divided by 10 to the third times 1. And I'm just going to cross out my joules for the sake of completion. So when I do that in my calculator, I get an answer which is 0.7 kilojoules. And that's correct. I mean, I am just moving my decimal place over three points, so it makes sense. 0.7 kilojoules. Now, what if I want to convert 500 megahertz to hertz? Again, I have to use the factor label method, so I'll draw that up. I have 500 megahertz. That's a lot of hertz, by the way. Um, and I have my given unit, which I put here on the bottom, and the unit I want right here on the top. So again, I have to remind myself, what is the relationship between megahertz and hertz? So in... Uh, a megahertz, I have 10 to the 6th power hertz. So I'd put 10 to the 6th power here, and I would have a 1 with megahertz. That's the way that would kind of work. And again, for completion, I guess I should probably cross out my megahertz as my unit. So now let's put that in our calculators. Again, if you start to get weird answers, it's probably because you need to put these things in parentheses. But I can do 500 times 10 to the 6th power divided by 1. So what do I get? I get 5, if I can do this, times 10 to the 8, and that would be in hertz. That would be my unit there. And that's, again, how I would convert from megahertz to hertz. So I know this is a little strange to talk about this at the very end, but remember, we have our two equations now. We have C equals lambda times V, and we have E equals H times V. And so the only two things we haven't talked about are C and H. Those are constants, and so they are things that we need to commit to memory because they're extremely important and they'll show up in a lot of different ways throughout sort of our unit. So what is the speed of light? Well, the speed of light in a vacuum is 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And so that's as fast as light can possibly travel in a vacuum. Planck's constant, on the other hand, is an extremely tiny, 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 tiny number. And it makes sense because we're looking at, you know, a little tiny photon of light. So we've got 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. And so we're going to be dealing with these tomorrow. And even though um, we're going to kind of be doing some mathematical 
uses of these constants, make sure that you understand how to convert between nanometers and meters, and you know how to convert from kilojoules to joules or joules to kilojoules, and you know how to convert from megahertz to hertz. It'll really come in handy if you can commit some of those to memory just for tomorrow.